We're Pastors George and Terry Pearsons. Welcome to this very special and timely edition of the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. We're wanting to give you taste of the Southwest Believers Convention that happened just a few weeks ago. The significance of meetings mm. in the plan of God cannot be overstated. That's right. So right That's now right. I wanna give you just a little glimpse of some of the excitement that surrounds these meetings of, for all ages, all all uh, economic status, everybody has something to be gained at the Southwest Believers Convention. Would you please welcome to the platform this morning, Brother Kenneth Copeland. Southwest Believers Convention number 43. Something about it when people who know how to use their faith come together to pray. I want you to think about David in the Bible. Think about how David he killed a lion and he killed a bear in private with nobody watching. But that prepared him to kill the, a giant in public with everybody watching. You will see this, go in the world and preach this gospel to every creature. Lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. Go do everything I do and greater works than these shall you do. That's what you ought to do, sir. I said greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I said the greater one, the greater one is right here. Nothing that he went through was unnecessary. Everything he was doing was buying you something. 2025 will come alive. Did you see what I'm talking about? Everybody that comes <laughs> to Southwest says, I'm coming back. Yeah, but there's something about this Southwest Believers Convention that was a little bit different. Um, we had lots of comments about Terry Savelle Foy, about Nancy Dufresne. It's, it's a different power that we had operating in the room there. I would uh, call it girl power, Holy Ghost girl <laughs> power. It was awesome. You yeah. know, I kept talking to people after yeah. the convention saying, yeah. what did you like most? What's the out to you most about the convention. And time after time, men mm -hmm. would say, oh, yeah. Nancy yeah. Dufresne, oh, Terry Foy, yeah. I got the most And the men that. that came to your prayer sessions. Yeah. Oh. oh they were. <laughs> 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 so Terry Foy has a message today. I tell you, it's good for everybody. It and really you are is. going to love hearing her. Jerry yeah. Savelle's daughter, Terry Savelle Foy, with a message for you today. This is your wake up call. So I wanna share with you this morning five keys that I learned from my favorite preacher on fulfilling your life assignment as a wake-up call to get up and get going. Are you ready? Okay, the first key, number one, is listen up. And yes, this is an ear, <laughs> listen up. Pretty sure Bill Winston's gonna pull out the same prop. <laughs> listen up, what does this mean? Well, dad told me, he said, anytime you go into your prayer time with the Lord, always take two things. Take a journal and take a pen and practice hearing the voice of God. Practice hearing God's voice. Well, I thought surely God will speak to my dad, but if God ever speaks to me, he'll probably say something like, I will smite thee with my nostrils or something, you know. <laughs> I found out that's not God, that's Jim Carrey from Bruce Almighty, but anyway. <laughs> This right here is the wake up call to discovering direction for your life and God's assignment. So I had no idea that successful people keep a journal. Jim Rohn said a life worth living is a life worth recording. God said in Jeremiah 30 verse two, write all the words I've spoken to you in a book. Do you wanna know why? It's pretty simple, because we'll forget. Did you know that research indicates that ideas not captured in writing within 37 seconds are likely never to be recalled again? In seven minutes, it's gone forever. So when you feel like God is speaking to you, write it down. When you hear something valuable, write it down. Mr. Copeland says one word from God can change your life forever. When you need clarity or direction for your life, write it down. So many times people say, don't just sit there, do something. I always say, don't just do something, sit there. And listen up and write down whatever you hear. You got it? Okay, number two. This one might be a little surprising. This, the first directive I ever got from the Lord, number two, is clean up. Clean up. That's the first thing I ever heard the Lord tell me to do with my life was clean my house. And I thought, is that the voice of God or my mom? Because surely, 
Surely that's not what God wants me to do with my life. Sweep, broom, mop, disinfect. But I began to discover that there is a link between organization and success. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. And here's why. Getting things cleaned up and in order, it's all about preparation for something greater. Let me explain it like this. Brother Copeland was laughing. This is my special forces Ken doll. Brother Copeland was holding it back there. <laughs> I want you to think about this. Before the military trains our soldiers to fight in mortal combat, they must first go through extensive bed making 101, right? Why is that? I mean, the enemy's not going to be impressed with the bounce a quarter off a bed trick, right? No, it's because it instills a standard of excellence. See, the military knows the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Can you imagine walking into the barracks of the United States Army and you see blankets piled in the corner, last night's clothes are thrown on the floor, the sheets are piled at the end of the bed? What would your impression be? We're in the hands of the elite or the hands of defeat, right? Well, see, I didn't realize people think the same thing about you when they jump in the car with you and it's a big mess, or they come to your house and it's a disaster. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. So the military knows if you're sloppy about making your bed, you'll be sloppy about loading your rifle. So they're establishing this standard with them. In fact, you may have heard about this, Admiral Bill McRaven, he's this intimidating Navy SEAL, partly responsible for capturing Osama bin Laden, and he stood before the University of Texas graduating class, gave the commencement speech. And he says to these graduates, he said, do you want to change the world? They're like, yeah. He said, start off by making your bed. <laughs> Why? Because the way you do anything is the way you do everything. I've heard Joyce Meyer say that before God would release her on the world, she had to get authority over a sink full of dirty dishes. Why? Well, the Bible says, if you're faithful with the little things, I'll make you ruler over many things. Number three is grow up. Grow up. Well, let me tell you what I mean by this. So I think one of the dumbest things I ever said was when I graduated from Texas Tech University, my family came to Lubbock to celebrate. We went to El Chico's restaurant. I had my cap and gown on, and I think I made the dumbest announcement I've ever made. I said to everyone, I will never study again. I thought I've paid my dues. I will never pick up another book. Now, the sad thing is I backed up my dumb promise for 11 years of my life. So for 11 years, never picked up another book. I lived paycheck to paycheck, no money in my savings account, um, paid my car note every month, paid my credit cards every month. This is what my routine was. I would wake up at the last minute to get dressed and go to work, jump in the car, turn on the radio and sing and dance all the way to the office, get to the office and work hard on my job. I was a ghostwriter for my dad. I probably wrote at least 25 books for dad. Five o'clock, jump in the car, turn the radio on, sing all the way home, get home, turn on the TV and just watch it for hours and do it again the next day and do it again the next day. For 11 years, I was more interested in watching other people live their dream than me go after mine. Finally, when I had this wake-up call and realized something has to change, I just decided to make myself pick up one book and read one page one day at a time. And I set the alarm on my phone for 20 minutes and I said, I'm gonna make myself read for 20 minutes. And it felt like torture. I kept looking at the clock <laughs> and I'm reading the book, but I did it again the next day. And I did it again the next day. And all of a sudden, something surprising began to happen. The more I read, the more I began to learn. The more I learned, the more I began to earn. As I began to grow, everything in my life began to grow. In fact, I remember reading a story about Jim Rohn, but Jim Rohn said that when he was struggling in life, he wasn't successful at all. He said he had pennies in his pocket, nothing in the bank. He said he was blaming everybody for where he was in life. He said he blamed the economy, the government, taxes. He blamed his boss. He blamed his parents. He blamed his lack of education. He blamed everyone for where he was. 
And this very wealthy man began to mentor him and just kind of take him under his wings, teach him how to be successful. But he was very blunt with him. He said, Jim, what you have at this moment in your life, you have attracted by the person you've become. He said, if you don't have much, perhaps you haven't become much. Well, Jim was so offended by that blunt statement. He said he held up his paycheck to this wealthy man and he said, you don't understand. He said, this is all they pay. His mentor said, no, this is all they pay you. He said, they pay others more. This is what they pay you. But then he began to teach him success in a loving way. And he said, Jim, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. But then he made this statement, and if you really hang on to this, it can change your life the way it changed mine. This is what he said. He said, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. He said, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. So Jim said he took that advice and he started by building his personal library, getting his hands on as many books and audios as he possibly could, coming to conferences like this and just consuming his life with growth. Well, within five years, not only was he a multimillionaire, but he became a coach to thousands of people all over the world. Well, as I began to read stories like this, and then just reading how the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. Or you could say it like this, much is required in order for much to be given. Number four is to look up. Number four is look up. This is your wake-up call to dream, to use your God-given imagination and get a dream for your life, God's vision for your life. You know, God told Abraham to look up from where he was. He told him to look up at the stars. He said, can you count them? He said, that's how many descendants you're gonna have. He was endeavoring to get Abraham to get an image on the inside, to use his imagination and see where he wanted to take him, right? You have to see your dream on the inside before it shows up on the outside. So three points I wanna make real quick about your dreams. Number one is God says you must have a vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But see, the opposite is true. With vision, you come alive. I like to compare it like this. Let's imagine as soon as this session is over, you're gonna go to lunch and it's pouring down rain outside. You jump in your car, the car works fine, the lights work, the air works, the radio works, pouring down rain, everything works, except for one thing, the windshield wiper, which I just happen to have. (laughs) It's crazy. (laughs) It's like Mary Poppins up here, right? But how many of you know you're not going anywhere? Because as long as your vision is impaired, you'll stay where you are. It's the same with life. As long as your vision is impaired, you're not going anywhere. So number one, God says you must have a vision. Number two, God says you must write the vision. Habakkuk 2.2 says, write the vision, make it plain. It doesn't say make it broad, make it vague, make it hazy. It says make it plain. So if your vision is, I'm believing God for increase this year, this is my year for supernatural increase. Well, here's 20 bucks and there's your increase. God said, make it plain. I remember hearing Brother Keith Moore say that so many times he would see uh, Kenneth Hagin. He would be praying at the altar, praying over people. And he would just gently tap him on the shoulder and he'd say, sweetheart, what are you praying for? What are you believing for? And so many times people would say, oh, nothing in particular. He'd say, then that's exactly what you're gonna get. Nothing in particular. No, God said, write the vision, make it plain. Creflo Dollar said, if Jesus himself showed up in your living room tonight and asked you, how much money do you need to get out of debt? He said, if you can't answer him, you're not serious about getting out of debt. But if you said, Lord, I am so glad you asked. (laughs) I need $37,556.82. Then you're serious about getting out of debt, right? So number one, you must have vision. Number two, you must write the vision. And number three, you must keep it before your eyes. Now, this right here was discovered as the number one reason dreams and goals go unachieved is because they're out of sight. That old saying, out of sight, out of mind, is true. In fact, Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so does he become. 
What you think about, you bring about, right? You know, I can't help but think of Miss Dodie Osteen. You know, when she was diagnosed with terminal cancer and she was given three weeks to live. And she said when she looked in the mirror, she saw death. She saw a weak, frail, deteriorating body. And she said, I knew I've got to change what I see if I'm going to get victory over cancer. So she said she went through the family photo albums and she pulled out pictures of her before she was diagnosed with cancer, when she looked energetic and full of life. She said she covered her bathroom mirror with these pictures. She put them all over the refrigerator door. You know what she said? I was surrounding myself with what can be, not what was. And God healed her of terminal cancer. We celebrated her 90th birthday last November. So here's my point. You have to see it before you see it. So this is the wake up call to use your imagination and start looking up. You got it? Okay, my fifth and final key is get up. And I don't mean right now, I'm just making a point, but get up. Now, what does that mean? That means to take action. The Bible says faith without action is dead. It's useless. I heard a success coach say it like this. The one thing that separates winners from losers more than anything else is winners take action. They get up and do what needs to be done. And here's what I've discovered. When it comes to taking action, it requires you to get out of your comfort zone, to be willing to feel awkward, vulnerable, uncomfortable, and to be willing to do some things that most people wouldn't do. In fact, think about the story in Luke 5. You remember the four guys who took their sick friend to meet Jesus. And when they got there, the place was so crowded, they couldn't get in. So they just assumed since it's so crowded, it must not be God's will. So they took the guy home and he died. No, they didn't assume that. They did what most people would not do. They climbed on top of a roof with a grown man in a stretcher got there, tore the shingles off the roof, lowered their friend in front of Jesus. And the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. And he healed the man. Well, when I read that story, I think, how can Jesus see faith? Because faith is invisible. He saw their action. He saw these people are willing to do what most people would never do. They're willing to feel uncomfortable, awkward, vulnerable, out of their comfort zone. But when Jesus sees you taking action, get ready. When Jesus sees you picking out baby furniture and you're not even pregnant, he sees you buying luggage and you can't even afford to go on the trip. He sees you touring a dream house that's not even in your budget. He sees you test driving the car. He sees you writing the manuscript and nobody's asking you for a book. When Jesus sees you taking action, get ready. The Lord said to me in prayer one day, and I wrote it down. He said, when I know you're ready, get ready. When I know you're ready, get ready. Coach John Wooden said it like this. When opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. You got to prepare now. So when God brings the opportunity, you can seize it, right? So this is the wake up call to get up and get ready. And I want to wrap it all up with this. I want to tell this story that you're familiar with, but I want you to think about Are y'all doing okay? Okay. I want you to think about the guy at the pool of Bethesda. You remember that story? It said, you know, that's where the, the sick, the disabled, the invalids would lay by this pool. And when an angel came, you know, when the water was stirring, they'd put them in the water and they'd be healed. Y'all know the story, but I'm going to summarize it and tell it probably a little differently. But there was one guy who had been laying there for 38 years. And you know, the disciples told Jesus, they said, this guy's been here for 38 years. So Jesus walks up to this man who's clearly sick and he says to him, do you want to get well? Why would Jesus need to ask someone who's clearly sick, do you even want divine health? Because nothing had changed in 38 years. So my question is, what could Jesus be asking us? Do you want to get out of debt? Do you want to start that business? Do you want that promotion? Do you want to build that church? Do you want to get married? Because nothing's changed in five years, 10 years, 17 years, 38 years. So you know the story the invalid said to Jesus, you know, every time I try, someone gets ahead of me. And Jesus, you know, in his heart of compassion, 
He just said to the invalid, he said, bless your heart, I had no idea what you had been through. Let me just help you up, right? (laughs) No, you know what Jesus said. The most compassionate man who's ever lived said to this precious man who's an invalid, get up, pick up your bed, and walk. In other words, get up. What does that mean? Nobody else can do this for you. You have to take responsibility for your life and for your assignment. Don't wait for other people to come along and cheer you on and say, you've got the right dream. You can do this. No, you have to become your own cheerleader. You have to pick yourself up. Then he said, pick up your bed. What does that mean? Clean up your surroundings. Get your environment in order. You've got a new standard now. You know the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And then he said, walk. Walking is a part of body language. We walk differently when we have vision. When you have a vision for your life, you don't walk with your head down, your shoulders slumped, you're dragging your feet. No, a person with vision walks faster because they have a destination in mind. So what could Jesus be saying to you today? Get up, pick up your music and sing. Get up, pick up your manuscript and write. Get up, pick up the microphone and preach. Get up, pick up your passport and go. Or get up, pick up your seed and sow. That one rhymed. Get up, pick up your clipboard and go after your assignment. I believe that this is a wake-up call to get up and take action. And you know, as I began to practice these habits, years ago, just little by little, practicing these habits, I remember I was driving to work one day And I was listening to a minister on a CD and he made this statement two times and then the CD ended. This is what he said. Somebody in need is waiting on the other side of your obedience. Somebody in need is waiting on the other side of your obedience. And I would be driving to work going, could somebody seriously be waiting on me to like listen up for God's voice, to clean my house, to read a book, to write my dream. No, nobody's waiting on me, but I would be driving and just keep hearing those words over and over. Well, today when I meet young girls who have stopped cutting themselves or they've gotten out of bad relationships because they just found me on YouTube, Or I think about the giant man in Seattle that I met after a conference one day. We were meeting people and taking pictures and stuff. And this giant man from Seattle looked at me and he said, can I have a hug? I was like, yes, sir. So I I hugged this man and he has tears pouring down his face. And we took a picture, you know, and then he walks off. Well, his daughter came running back to me and she said, Terry, you will never know what that hug and what those tears mean to our family. I said, what? She said, my dad was an atheist, alcoholic, near suicidal, wanted nothing to do with God. She said, he stumbled upon you on the Victory Channel. Your voice got his attention. I said, imagine that. (laughs) She said, I want you to know my dad is not a fan. He is a fanatic about Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But my question is, who could be waiting on the other side of your obedience? Miles Monroe said it like this, the richest place in the world, it's not the diamond mines of South Africa, it's not the oil fields of the Middle East. He said the richest place in the world is the graveyards. It's the cemeteries. In the grave, there's books never written, songs never sung, businesses never started, churches never planted. Don't go to the grave with your dream still in you. These days, as the headlines deliver a relentless stream of bad news about the future of the U.S. economy, The mainstream media's experts are warning of runaway inflation and coming shocks to the financial system, all of which leads many sincere believers to wonder whether it's even possible to thrive financially in times such as these. Here's good news. In their timely book, The Power to Prosper in Troubled Times, Gloria Copeland and Pastor George Pearsons offer you a hopeful, encouraging answer and reveal powerful, proven keys to operating in God's economic system rather than the world's. Are you ready to put the spiritual laws that govern supernatural increase and abundance to work in your life? 
Order The Power to Prosper in Troubled Times by Gloria Copeland and Pastor George Pearsons for only $16.99 on kcm.org slash TV special or call 800-600-7395. This is your wake-up call. You know, what a tremendous message from Terry Savelle Foy and how all of us are needing that wake-up call. And there's one very important wake-up call that every one of us needs to make, and that is waking up to making Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives. You know, you can go along in life and just think everything's fine and have never really made that decision to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. Never really made that decision to give your life to Him and then receive His life for you. He paid an awesome price so that you could walk close with God, know God, be born again of the Holy Spirit and be filled with the Holy Spirit and be a partaker of His divine nature and His blessings. I'm telling you right now, this is your wake-up call. And maybe you've walked away from the Lord. Maybe you've just been playing Christian. Now is the time to decide the line in the sand I'm waking up right now, I'm waking up my life, and I'm giving it to Jesus. I'm giving it over to Him. We wanna pray with you right now to to make that decision, to answer that wake-up call and give your life over to Him. I like to do this. Just put your hand over your heart right now, and I want you to say this after me. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I receive Jesus. I receive Jesus. As my Lord and my Savior. As my Lord and my Savior. Take my life. Take my life. And do something with it. And do something with it. I will follow you. I will follow you. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Make that declaration. I am a Christian. I am a Christian. I'm a believer. Yes. I'm not a doubter. Yep. I'm full of victory. Hallelujah. That's right. And if you did that, we want you to call and contact us. We have a book that Kenneth and Gloria have written for you called He Did It All For You. And we got some other information that we want you to have to begin studying and reading your Bible and just getting immersed in this new life in Christ Jesus, to build your relationship with the Lord and get to know the one who truly, truly loves you. It's our joy to do that. And we don't want you to forget that we're offering to you the power to prosper in troubled times. That's right. So both of those are available to you if you just reach out and contact us, the information that's on your screen. The price for the prospering book is there, but our gift to you is that he did it all for you. Praise God. We so much want to be a blessing to you because that's God's heart to be a blessing for you. That's right. And that's why we have all of these broadcasts on kcm.org. You can watch Southwest or you can join us next year, July the 28th through August the 2nd, 2025. Find out more about all of that at kcm.org. Don't forget, God loves you. We We love love you. And and Jesus Jesus is is Lord. Lord.